Okay, good morning. Good morning. Cool, this modern technology. Whatever happened to just plain microphones? Anyway. <laughs> well, good morning. Welcome back to the second part after a gap of about four or five weeks, the second part of our study of the book of Jude. Once again, we, we will be referring to, our, to the sister passage to Jude, which is the second epistle to Peter, chapter 2. So if you could keep a finger or bookmark, if you've got something electronic in that passage. To briefly recap, and for those that weren't here that for the last time, we looked at the first four verses of Jude, and we saw how Jude had intended to write a book, an epistle, about the gospel. About our com- he described it as our common salvation. However, in verse 3, Jude declared he found it necessary or compelled urgently to exhort his readers to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. Now, by that phrase, the faith, it is the definite article. He is not talking about faith that we have internally, that we express subjectively. He is talking about the full revealed body of truth that God has given the church in his word, the Bible. That is what we are to contend for. In verse 4, we read of certain men who crept in unawares, men who Jesus himself warned about as false prophets, men who Paul warned about as savage wolves who would come into the church. They come in with an agenda of corrupting God's people with false doctrine and devious practices, such as teaching Christians that they can sin freely and yet still be believers. Thus, they abuse the grace of God. Also, those who deny Christ with their teaching, denying, for example, the atonement, the virgin birth, the substitutionary death and resurrection of Christ, bringing legalism, that's another one, legalism. You're only saved if you believe, plus you do this or you do that. And finally, we saw how nothing has changed over the last 1900 years. This book is still relevant, very relevant today. Things have probably got worse. And we saw with the advent of of books, of elements, I will say elements because it's not all, elements of Christian TV, but especially the internet. These false teachers can spread their toxic doctrine amongst believers. So to pick up where we left off, In verses 5, 6, and 7, Jude looks back to three Old Testament accounts as as examples of apostasy and the inevitable judgment that God brings against it. Now, before we look at these examples, we need to see what is meant by the word apostasy and what a person who commits this sin, namely an apostate, looks like. Now, the word apostasy is from the Greek word apostasia. And it it means this. It means to turn away from a previous stance, to depart from a fixed point. And in the context of the Christian faith, apostasy is a defection or a revolt against the truth of Scripture, a deliberate turning away from Jesus Christ. Now, an apostate is a person who has come to a knowledge of the truth, but has hardened his heart and turned back in unbelief and rebelled against that truth. The apostate has never truly fully come to saving faith in Christ. We must say that to start with. He only comes to a place of understanding of the faith before ultimately rejecting it. In other words, they have only head knowledge, but not heart faith. There's a big difference. 
I'd rather have heart faith than head knowledge. Because head knowledge won't save me. Heart faith will. Amen? Amen. The book of Hebrews, chapter, chapter 10, verses 26 and 27, describes these people perfectly. For if we sin willfully, turn away from Christ. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment, which will devour the adversaries. It's a fear, fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God in this way. Amen. A prime example from the Bible of an apostate is Judas Iscariot. He walked with Christ for three years. He saw the miracles, heard the teaching. He heard teaching beyond anything we have in the Bible. He had it firsthand. He blended in so well with the other, other disciples, they, they didn't know who he was. They thought he was one of them. He looked the part, sounded the part, but his heart turned away and apostatized from Christ. He had head knowledge, but not hard faith, heart faith. And ultimately, of course, he betrayed our Savior, didn't he? Amen. Now, this is a condition of, of the, in inverted commas, the certain men who have crept in, who Jude describes in verse 3. And those who Peter refers to as false teachers in 2 Peter 2, verse 1. They attempt to bring in their apostate ways and their destructive heresies into the church to corrupt God's people. And this is something we must be prepared for in the yeah. days we live in. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. Out there in the world, things are going mad. Some of the things that are being taught today in, in the world, in schools, I won't describe them. They are insanity. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. That could possibly could be attempted to be brought into the church. We must resist that. Yeah. Stand yeah. against yeah. it. Yeah. Amen. But before Christ returns, 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3 warns us that that day will not come unless the, definite article again, the falling away comes first. Or apostasy comes first. Paul is telling us that prior to the return of Jesus Christ for his church, there will be an abandonment from many supposed Christians of the faith. So Jude and Peter now begin their description of these apostate false teachers and what is in the heart of these deceivers. And it does not make pleasant reading. They do not hold back. I think these days, if, Peter, if those original apostles were in the church, how many would be offended? They were. <laughs> Jude 4, verse 4 tells us, these deceivers are marked out yeah. for this condemnation, or they are ordained for judgment. Yeah. God, in his omniscience, in his foreknowledge, has pronounced judgment on them already. That's a fearful thought, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. 2 Peter 2, verse 1 reads that they bring on themselves swift destruction. And verse 3, Peter tells us, their judgment has not been idle, and their destruction does not slumber. In the mind of God, they are guilty and judged already. Peter would further comment in verse 21 that it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from or to apostatize from it. Yes. So let's be in no doubt no doubt at all, that it's the gravest of sins to turn away from Christ and then seek to corrupt his bride, the church, with toxic false doctrine. Jude and Peter then reinforce the inevitability of God's judgment on these false teachers with three examples from the Old Testament. If you just look at verse 5 of Jude.
Verse 5, but I want to remind you, though you once knew this, that the Lord, having saved the people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. The Israelites have been delivered, haven't they, from hard bondage in Egypt. God had brought them out with a mighty deliverance. The plagues against Egypt, the parting of the Red Sea. Yet what did Israel do? They complained. They spoke against the Lord. What wickedness, isn't it? Numbers 14, verses 2 and 3. And all the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation, all of them, said to them, If only we had died in the wilderness. Why has the Lord brought us to this land to fall by the sword? That our wives and our children should become victims. Would it not have been better for us to return to Egypt? Ostasy, isn't it? Amen. Israel hardened their hearts into a place of rebellion and unbelief. In the Lord who had delivered them, they apostatized in their hearts and an entire generation died in the wilderness. Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 and 8, we don't get off lightly with this one, warns us of this and its reference to it. Today, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. And in verse 12, beware, brethren, Beware, brethren, all of us, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing, in apostatizing from the living God. So this account presents us with a look inside the heart of an apostate false teacher, and it shows us an attitude of rebellious unbelief in a heart hardened against the living God. The second example from Jude is verse 6. And the angels who did not keep their proper domain, but left their own abode, he has reserved in everlasting chains unto darkness for the judgment of the great day. 2 Peter 2 verse 4 records the same event. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness... Now, these two passages have provoked much debate amongst Bible students over the years. Do they refer to the fate of angelic beings who fell with Lucifer in heaven? That's one version. Or are these verses a reference to the events of Genesis chapter 6? It's one of those points in which Christians differ on and and grace differ on. It's, it's not a big issue. It's, it's just one of those sort of issues. Yeah. My view is this. Genesis 6 verse 4 records, there were giants on the earth in those days and also afterward when the sons of God came into the daughters of men and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Now the phrase sons of God in the Old Testament nearly always refers to angels. As in Job 1.6, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came among them. It was angelic beings. The angels who Jude and Peter referred to were fallen angels in Genesis 6. Angels who in some way, which is a bit of a mystery, cohabited with the women of that day and produced a race of giants or Nephilim. In doing so, they provoked the judgment of God which resulted in the flood of Noah's day. The great sin of these fallen angels was a rebellion against God's order and seeking to corrupt and dominate the human race. Likewise, the false teacher today seeks a place of authority to corrupt God's church with heresy and seek to exploit and lead Christians away from the true faith 
into an apostate counterfeit faith. The third example God gives us in his word, verse 7, as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, in a similar manner to these, have given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh and are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Jude is referring here to the account of Genesis 18 and 19. In verse 7, he describes the men of Sodom and Gomorrah having given themselves over to sexual immorality and going after the phrase strange flesh. Why that phrase, strange flesh? Again, it is a stepping over the boundaries God has set in his word which is Genesis 2, verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become what? One flesh. Not strange flesh, one flesh. Jesus repeated this word for word in the New Testament. Those who say Jesus didn't, I've got it wrong, I'm afraid. So Jude, in giving these three, these three examples of unbelieving Israel, wicked fallen angels, and depraved Sodom and Gomorrah, and the judgment each fell under, shows us the utter depravity and certain judgment of those who seek to deceive God's people. But Jude doesn't end there. He further states in verse 8, Likewise, also, these dreamers defile the flesh, they reject authority and speak evil of dignitaries. 2 Peter 2 verse 10 calls them presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries. Jude tells us they reject authority. Now to reject authority is to usurp or try to replace dominion or power. These apostates often step over the line in their doctrine and practice. And they do this by speaking evil of dignitaries. A very interesting phrase. What on earth does it mean to speak evil of dignitaries? Now, you look in the Greek and the word dignitaries means glories. In this context, it means fallen angels or demonic powers. To put all this together, some of these false teachers in their spiritual fantasy world step over the line into a form of spiritual warfare in which they attempt to engage directly with demonic powers, reviling them with evil speech. That is not biblical. The biblical way to deal with the enemy is Ephesians 6. That's a whole other topic, but that's the way we go. We stand on the truth and we resist. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. We don't get involved with this kind of stuff. We can see, see the context of verse 7 if you cast your eyes down to verse 8. This is what Jude is talking about. Yet Michael the archangel, in contending with the devil over the body of Moses, listen to the word, dared not bring against him a reviling accusation. This is an archangel, okay? But said, the Lord rebuke you. So if an archangel would not dare revile Satan, how much less men who dream of some authority that they do not possess revile angelic majesties? Okay, verse 11. Woe to them, for they have gone in the way of Cain, and have run greedily in the era of Balaam for profit and perished in the rebellion of, Kor of Korah. Firstly, they've gone in the way of Cain. Genesis 4 describes how Abel brought the sacrifice of the, of, of the firstborn of his flock, blood sacrifice. God accepted it. Cain, on the other hand, brought an offering of the fruit of the ground, a works offering. God rejected it. So the way of Cain 
is a form of religion without the atoning sacrifice of Christ, a bloodless Christianity. That kind of Christianity is a fake. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. What does the word say? Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Amen? Only by the blood of Jesus Christ. Now, Rob and I, we have a, an uncle who is, he, I think he's 101 this year. And he, he's, he's, he is failing. But, 101 years old, and he has put into, into book form the story of his life. And it, it is a brilliant read, isn't it, Rob? A great read. You see like, what life was like in the, in the 1930s when he was growing up. The chapter on his religious belief is a real eye-opener. Our uncle was brought up to go to the Methodist church and notes, he, he records in his book how he, how he was taught as a boy the, the core truths of the Christian faith, faithfully taught it. While he was a young man, a new minister came to the church. Now, this man had totally different ideas on what Christianity was all about. Out went sound biblical teaching. He rejected the deity of Christ. And the miracles of Christ, he said, were a myth. He denied the resurrection of Jesus, the infallibility of the Bible, and especially he threw out the atoning sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Why? Because he found it offensive. Amen? The offense of the cross, isn't it? Now, whilst this minister was described in the book as a kind, compassionate man with no record whatsoever of any scandal. He was, in truth, a false teacher yeah. who had gone in the way of Cain. Now you can, can you see that? How, how it is the way of Cain. And now, these days, many de denominations are led by men and women like this. They hold, view, hold similar views. And as Cain hated Abel, these people despise the true gospel of Jesus Christ. This minister so influenced my uncle as a young man that he left the church and never returned. He abandoned any faith he ever had. And to this day, tragically, on the cusp of death, his heart is hardened against Jesus Christ. My uncle was ruined I know it's partly his own fault for not believing, but he was ruined by a false teacher. Yeah, yeah. Amen. Interestingly, I had a post on my, on my Facebook about a month ago. It said this about Lent. Now, we don't, we don't celebrate Lent, but some, some Christians do, and bless them for doing it, if they, if they want to do that. Lent is a time when we are inundated with dangerous Theology. What is this dangerous theology? I, mean, I was intrigued then. <laughs> I carried on reading. Christians must remember that it was Jesus' life centered on justice and liberation that led to the cross. Now listen to this one. He was not crucified to atone for the sins of humanity. Can you hear the heresy there? Yeah, it's Amen. This is how it slips in. That post was from a member of a group called Progressive Christianity. A group that is neither progressive or Christian. Amen. But that, that is the way of Cain. Jude then shows a second kind of false teacher. Those who run greedily in the error of Balaam for profit. Second Peter chapter 2, verse 15 describes them as having forsaken the right way and gone astray, following the way of Balaam, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. In the book of Numbers, chapters 22 to 24, Balaam was a prophet 
who hired out his gifting to Israel's enemies for money. And he then led Israelite men into sin, deliberately led them into sin with Moabite women. The era of Balaam, that false teachers of a certain, of a certain ilk, operate in is to merchandise their gifting for the purpose of making money and lots of it. Amen. They use the spiritual to gain the material. Watch enough Christian TV and you'll come across them. I promise you, you will come across them. They will promise you health, wealth and prosperity. For a price. Yeah, that's right. Only for a price. Yeah. And what's the price? You must sow a seed yeah. <laughs> into their ministry. Yeah. And it's usually a substantial amount. If you lack the cash, use your credit card. Get into debt for Jesus. Amen. This is what some of them do. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong, you know, for, for, for genuine ministry... Support it financially. Yes, that, that, that's great and that's godly, but not th not this. No, amen. There are some some of them will even give you a on request a personal prophecy yeah, yeah. for a price. Yeah. And I promise you, it don't come cheap. Expect to pay three figures or more for some Rubbish. prophecy. <laughs> The net worth of the wealthiest one is estimated at three quarters of a billion dollars. Imagine that, all off, the, all off the proceeds of ministry. Many of them live like Hollywood film stars, mansions, designer clothes, fleets, fleets of cars, aircraft, one's got his own airport, Five-star hotels. The prosperity gospel they preach is not the gospel Paul preached. No. It is not. No. It is not the gospel Wesley preached. No. It is a false way. It is a way that does not save souls. How well does Jude say they have run greedily in the era of Balaam? How well does Peter say they have a heart trained in covetous practices? And how accurate is Paul in Romans 16? Those who do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. And by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple or the naive or the innocent. Now, if you've heard them, you realize what, how, what Paul talks about smooth speech. Some of them are slick. Yeah. They are so slick. Yeah. Jude then gives us a third kind of false teacher, those who have perished in the rebellion of Korah. Numbers chapter 15, Korah and 250 other men rebelled against the God-ordained leadership of Moses. Korah sought, sought to replace Moses with himself as leader of Israel. He wanted a place of authority amongst God's people that was not his to have. Yeah. And he perished. He died under the judgment of God. Jude is warning us of similar men or women who try to usurp or undermine godly leadership in the church. They go about this usually with a, starts off with a whispering campaign. They look to draw a following for themselves. They can and they sometimes do cause church splits yeah. and disruption with their ways. An example of this is in the third epistle of John, verses 9 and 10. John writes, and this is the amplified version, I have written briefly to the church, but Diotrephes, here's our character, <laughs> Diotrephes, who likes to take the lead, or as the New King James Version says, he loves to have the preeminence. Yeah. Now that should tell us a lot about this character immediately. Yeah. He likes to take the lead among them and put himself first. He does not acknowledge my authority and refuses to accept my suggestions or listen to me. John carries on. So when I arrive, 
I will call attention to what he is doing. He's boiling over and casting malicious act reflections upon us with insulting language. Now, would you like to have been a fly on the wall when John arrived? Yeah. <laughs> a confrontation was going to happen. Amen. Now, this kind of thing actually happened in this church years ago. A man with previous history of causing major problems in churches turned up. He soon began a, a malicious campaign against Rob. Yeah. He even sent letters. I don't know if any of you remember this. He yeah. sent letters to every member yeah, with accusations about Rob, about the leadership of the church. All, lies, all, lies. all totally false, Terry. Yes, I know that. Amen. <laughs> but this is how they operate. They seek to undermine church leadership. Yeah. Caro and I had an example. Didn't we, Caro? A few years ago, in a church in Tor Point, a man turned up. We knew he was trouble. And he sat at the back, nice and peaceful during the meeting. As soon as the meeting ended, he started, didn't he? A man with a, with a big issue against authority in the church. He was fresh from causing ructions, and I mean that, that, that word, in a church in Ivy Bridge about a month previous. And he would go from church to church yeah. doing it. Yeah. These people are out there. Yeah. They really are, unfortunately. Yeah. But Jude hasn't finished with them yet. He writes in verses 12, 13, 16, 18, and 19. I'll be very brief with this. He describes them as spots in your love feast or hidden reefs. Calm on the outside, treacherous beneath the surface. He describes them as clouds without water or clouds that don't produce rain. Proverbs 25, 14 tells us, whoever falsely boasts of gifts is like clouds in wind without rain. They are late autumn trees without fruit, no spiritual fruit, raging waves of the sea, foaming up their own shame, like the seashore after a storm. You get all the, all the flotsam, then you know, all the... All, all the, wheat, all the seaweed, everything. It looks a mess, doesn't it? That's what they do. Verse 16, they are grumblers, complainers, living according to their own lusts, and mouthing great swelling words, flattering people to gain an advantage. Verse 18, they are mockers. In verse 19, they are sensual persons, or they walk and live and operate in the flesh. And they cause trouble in church assemblies. To sum them up, they pollute the church. They bring in ungodly ways and cause division. They and their corrupt doctrine are to be avoided like the plague. Yeah. Now, does that sound harsh and judgmental? Doesn't the word say judge, lest, judge not, lest ye be judged? No, but it does. But the word also says judge with righteous judgment. Amen. Okay. They are not to be tolerated. Paul in Romans 16 verse 17 says this. Now I urge you, brethren, note or mark those who cause division and avoid them. They are not to be tolerated in the church. So how are we to avoid? How do we get away from being caught in the net of a false teacher? Jude gives us the answer to this in verses 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, or as the Amplified says, rise up like an edifice. I love that. Brilliant, isn't it? A great, great translation. Praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ and to eternal life. In other words, Abide in Christ. That's our, our, the first and our main way of avoiding a false teacher. How do we build ourselves up in the faith? How do we do it? Firstly, 1 Timothy 4 verse 7, we exercise ourselves unto godliness. Just like a bodybuilder spends hours of training to get the physique he wants. So we must put time... It takes time. Put time into Bible study. Put, put time into your prayer life. Put time into fellowship with one another. Put time into attending meetings. 
Iron sharpens iron. Amen? If we're young in the faith, then desire the sincere milk of the word. If we're more mature in the faith, there is the meat of the word. And we can supplement our Bible study by reading good, sound books from Bible teachers. Books, and we need to read books that will stretch us spiritually, that will stretch us theologically. If we would see further in the faith, then stand on the shoulders of the giants of the faith and read books by the great saints, the great saints of the past and present. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Charles Spurgeon, the famous Victorian preacher, said this, visit many books, but live in the Bible. Yes. Amen. Now that man would read four to five books a week. He also ran an orphanage. He also preached. Yeah. And how much time did he give to Bible study for all that? I mean, the man must have been a studying machine, didn't he? Secondly, 1 John 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit. Do not believe every teacher that comes along. Be a Berean. What did the Bereans do in the book of Acts when Paul preached to them? They searched the scriptures to see if it was so. And Paul, did he get offended by that? I'm the great apostle. How dare you? No. He commended them for it. It's wisdom. Always check the scriptures from what you hear. Amen. In other words, we, we must use discernment. A great biblical word. Someone asks, what is discernment? That's a good question. It's the ability to see what is hidden. To perceive that which is beneath the surface. To understand beyond the face value of something. To give you an example of discernment, from, a very simple example from everyday life. Occasion, occasionally, Carol will say to me, could you um, drop me into town and pick me up later? I'll uh, text you when I'm ready. Now, at face value, what, what could be more innocent? I've got off shopping. I've got left to go. It's brilliant, isn't it? What could be more innocent? However, discern, what does discernment tell me about that? It tells me this. Somewhere in town, there's a sail on. <laughs> and, and, amen. There's a sail on. And Carol, Carol is on maneuvers. Oh. Amen. And I can feel in my wallet, my bank, my bank card trembles. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, how do I discern this? Because after 28 years of marriage, I know her ways. Amen. Yeah. Now, to get a good level, just bring this into, into the spiritually. Now, to get a good level of spiritual discernment, what do we need? We need to know our God. Yeah. Amen. That's the best way to discern the true from the false. Amen. Now, there's no need, and it's wrong, don't become a heresy hunter. Some people, you look on the internet, there's whole, whole web pages devoted to it. All they do is they, they chase after heretics and wrong teaching. It's a rabbit hole to, avo to avoid that one. Because if you go down that road, you take your eyes off Jesus. Amen? I've, I've done that myself years ago. It's a trap you fall into. No, what we do, we fill our hearts and minds with the truth and walk in the light of Christ. And that way, anything that's spiritually dodgy that comes along, immediately it flags up. Now, I shared last time I, I had a couple of jabs. What did, one for pneumonia, one for flu. Now, what, what have those jabs done for me? They've given me antibodies, haven't they? So if a, vir if a flu virus, if it comes along, I've got the, the antibodies to jump on it, kill it, it's done, done and dusted, it's all over. So God's word, in a similar way, in our, when it's in our hearts and minds, it acts like a spiritual antibody. So when a dodgy teaching comes along, instantly it is written, the flag up. Amen. 
So in conclusion, why, why bring this kind of teaching at, at this moment of time when we're going forward in God? What, what, doesn't it seem a little bit off? No. Yeah. I don't believe it. Anyone believes it, I don't believe it is. I think it's necessary. Yeah. When we look at what Sam prophesied, yeah. I truly believe we're in a move of God, yeah. in the first throes of yeah. a move of God. Yeah. We're moving forward, aren't we, in, in, the, in the wonderful promises of that prophetic yeah. word. Amen. But we must recognize, sooner or later, the enemy's going to oppose it. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. He always opposes the moves of God. Yeah. You'll see, it's scripture, you see it in the Bible. It's just what he does. Yeah. How will the enemy attack this church? I've no idea. I don't know. I don't know. But if I know this, if we only watch for a frontal attack, he may come in the back door with a character, one of the characters we've, we've been talking about this morning. Should we fear an attack like this or a frontal attack? Should we fear it? No. no. Isaiah 52 verse 12, For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. No. For the Lord will go before you, Amen. and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. Amen. Amen. So to finish, Jude, having unburdened his heart for the church, ends his epistle with a, with a lovely doxology. Yeah. Verses 24 and 25. Now to him, who is able, Amen. he is able Amen. to keep you from stumbling yeah. and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Amen. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, Amen. be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And on that note of praise, we'll end. Amen. Amen.